Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news for May 8th to the 14th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it. And of course, if you want to learn more, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, especially in the US identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up that you think will be worth more in the future than they are now, and take advantage whenever you feel ready, if you wish to do so, pending the regulatory news that we've been getting. But after this historic meeting that we had on Thursday, uh, the hearing in the Senate Banking Committee, it turns out that there will apparently be no vote on SAFE today. Uh, and so I do apologize for sharing that quote from Kim Rivers that made it seem like they could move straight into a vote. A little bit too much hopium uh, for me that day, I suppose. But Chairman Brown gave senators seven days to submit questions and gave witnesses 45 days to respond. And so, of course, uh, when we hear it from Congress or from politicians, whenever they say soon, Schumer's been saying soon for a long time, that's literally been two and a half years. And so it looks like SAFE could drag out into this fall. It doesn't mean that it will. Uh, they've said that we, we're going to act on it quickly. But of course, prepare for your own situation because it very well could drag on to the fall of 2024. You never know. And so uh, just a bit of input. So end of June would be around when questions and answers deadline hit. Maybe bill drops July. That's the best case scenario. But again, we obviously have to plan for the worst. Thank you, Cannabis Consumer Advocate, for this post and the extra info, because apparently from July 1st to October 9th, the Senate is only scheduled to be in session for about nine days. Yikes, do they do any work? They may schedule more days, but if they don't, it will be late fall before they could pass it out of committee for a floor vote. So if you can, please contact your state reps and senators. I think we need the push and uh, just the demand now more than ever, because of course, while quickly means for us to move fast, in congressional parlance, it means sometimes this session or next soon can mean two and a half years. And so I'll put the schedule for the Senate below in the description if you want to check that out. But so with that, uh, this one from Kiplinger, just highlighting a bunch of news in the industry. Of course, Safe Banking Act finds support as Senate hearings begin. And unfortunately, one of the witnesses certainly worked against us more than we thought. And we'll get to that in a moment. But this week in cannabis investing, stealing my title. Uh, good that the cannabis legislation is finding support from the American Bankers Association as it always has. And so you can pause to read for a little bit here about what... Um, the ABA was asking for, but just to highlight, Missouri cannabis sales reach milestone. Pause to read if you're interested to catch up a little bit about Missouri. Maryland to launch rec cannabis sales this summer, July 1st, and med providers will switch over to adult use providers. While New Jersey becomes the newest legal state to join in efforts and support tax relief for cannabis companies, passing a bill making it so that operators in their state can deduct this burden from their state tax, hopefully reducing the overall tax that they have to pay because the 280E predatory tax is still applicable at the federal level, unfortunately. So you can pause to read. Otherwise, grab the link below if you want to read through that. But the most surprising thing we got out of Thursday from the hearing, uh, despite Kevin Sabat making a fool out of himself completely by himself, we didn't have to help at all. But Dama Financial, which is apparently an institution that is currently providing banking services to cannabis. So they have a head start, no doubt, providing cannabis businesses access to a secure, transparent banking solution, secure cash and pay electronically. You think if SAFE would pass, they could expand their their businesses, right? And reach more in the industry. But Jason Wild adds his input as someone who attended, never seen a company sell out its customers like Dama Financial did today at the Senate hearing on SAFE. And I wonder if anyone uh, incentivized them to, to testify in that way. Absolutely disgusting and despicable. They testified against the passage of SAFE banking saying, well, we can provide safe banking services, but I don't think any banks in the country can do what we can do. Uh, and so you shouldn't pass safe so us exclusively can just work with the banks. It's unfucking believable. Talk about betraying your customers to protect your self interest. And so a lot of good input down here highlighting just how ridiculous this is. A uh, bit of a hiccup, but I wouldn't say it's really detrimental or anything. And so with that, adding that the support from the ABA continues and it is strong as this, this tweet came out um, from a story from Marijuana Woman again after the hearing. And so ABA is not stopping with their support, which we love to see. 50 state bankers associations, insurance groups, and top unions urge passage of cannabis banking bill. Uh, the Safe Banking Act is an urgently needed and widely supported bipartisan legislative solution. No doubt, especially when banks across the country are collapsing and this industry has the solution to their liquidity problems, 30 billion in cash or so. And so I think very promising to hear this continued momentum after the hearing, especially despite the negativity we got from DAMA. And so sharing some of these from Marijuana Moment, uh, some updates, uh, but just the summary because I read through them and they don't tell us anything that we don't already know. But thank you, Todd, for sharing. As after the hearing, uh, 12.47 p.m. May 11th, we get another call from Schumer, Booker, and Wyden, renewing the call for expungements, of course, progress on SAFE, but we can't have SAFE without some social justice provisions to be added to banking bill following committee hearing, which is fair, of course. We all want the expungements, but we also want to see some incremental reform as opposed to nothing, 
to give the cannabis industry some relief. And so specifically, they want to incorporate provisions of the HOPE Act. Fair enough. I hope they can get these negotiations done and get HOPE and SAFE. If, if that's all they can do and they can get that passed, I think that would be amazing. And again, incremental is better than nothing, which would support states that want to expunge cannabis records with grants. And so a link in the description if you want to check that out. So this came May 11th and then May 12th, interestingly enough to hear Schumer talk about cannabis a second day in a row, but Schumer wants cannabis banking bill to get committee vote in the near future. And so we go from soon, which could mean anything from one day to two and a half years under his definition, and it changes soon to in the near future. Some more promising than not, but reiterating plan to attach the HOPE Act. We were really moving forward in a record way on a very important issue. And so this was more promising to get than not. And so link in the description if you wanted to check that out. But last bit about the hearing too is thank you connoisseurs.io for digging and finding this, for finding some dirt on our favorite fake clown doctor, Kevin Sabat, who blocks anyone that shows him data counter to his outdated and false beliefs that he's paid to believe. But as the CEO of Learn About Sam, turns out their 501c nonprofit anti-cannabis lobbying company has not filed IRS Form 990 since this article came out in 2019, forcing the nonprofit to disclose donors, the article said. And so this is from Times Union. We'll put that link in the description. The sources of funding for a group lobbying against legislative efforts to legalize adult use uh, cannabis in New York could soon be revealed. And the State Joint Commission on Public Ethics on Tuesday denied a request from the New York chapter of Smart or Sam New York to keep its donors private. Denied a request, therefore they should have to disclose it. The decision can be appealed, a tactic that has been a successful option for organizations initially denied an exemption. What are you hiding, Kevin? So since 2019, it's been almost four years now, they have not done this. Uh, obviously pretty suspect. Um, the Pension Prote Protection Act of 2006 added a new law that provides for automatic revocation of an organization tax exempt status if it fails to file a required annual information return for three consecutive years. Huge. I'm sure Kevin has a perfectly legitimate excuse for this that we'd all love to hear. And so, man, love to see that from connoisseurs.io. Hopefully we can use this um, in a more productive way forward uh, against Kevin uh, as he's uh, used his efforts and his resources against us. But just wanted to share that for what it's worth. While well, we got TerraSend reporting their record first quarter 2023 revenue. So just going to read some highlights. I'm not a shareholder of TerraSend. You can grab the link in the description if you want to learn more about them or if you are. But first quarter 2023 financial highlights you can pause to read of course there's more in here you can grab the full link in the description but then lastly financial summary q1 2023 and comparative periods you can pause to read as well but thank you can investments for your deeper dives and breakdowns uh, and for sharing them with us as modest q1 showing from terrasend with results in line with expectations and better gross margins in a seasonally slow q1 but also tax adjusted cash flow that still needs work to sustain the business long term uh, maryland adult use in july should offer a boost uh, as does the potential tsx uplisting potential potential in June. And so uh, pause to read for a bit more on Terra Centier. And then just sharing from what I get out of this is that they have income tax that they have to pay, um, but they maybe chose not to pay it yet in order to say that they produce cash flow from operations. I'm not exactly sure, um, but uh, let me know in the comments if I'm accurate here or if it's a little different and I just misinterpreted that. But so uh, Missouri cannabis businesses improve access to banks under bill heading to governor. So essentially following in New Jersey's footsteps and some of those other markets, as on Friday, the Missouri House passed a bill allowing cannabis business owners to sign a waiver giving permission for state agencies to share their licensing and inspection information with their financial institutions. Hopefully this is in order to help them and not uh, use it against them, but the feds have advised banks that they can provide services to the cannabis industry if they follow the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network FinCEN guidelines. And these are supposed to be updated once they finally passes. Um, but so from what I understand, the bill is now headed to the governor's desk. Um, and then Senator Steve Roberts of St. Louis has sponsored the bill since 2021 and says it has passed out of the Senate committee every year, but has always stalled after that. His bill this year also passed out of the House Friday, but it needs one more vote in the Senate. So you can pause to read more. Hopefully he can get the vote to help the businesses in Missouri. Uh, big step in the right direction. But with that, true leave and Verano, I Florida for growth despite contrasting Q1 outcomes. And so while I did share true leave and Verano's videos in my weekday video, and it'll be in the description if you wanted to check that out. If you did not watch that, you can tune in, or of course you can pause to read uh, to learn this write-up from Green Market. Both Trulieve and Verano are excited about opportunities in Florida, I'm sure for different reasons. Uh, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just a resource if you want to learn more about Trulieve and Verano from another perspective, this one written by Adam Jackson. So pause to read there. You can pause to read this snippet, otherwise full link in the description, of course, to go through it all on your own time. Um, but a little bit more here if you wanted to pause to read. And so with that, truly, apparently continuously <laughs> dumps another bit of money, 8 million this time into recreational cannabis legalization. That's got to bring them over 30 million at this point. Um, and so just to highlight, truly, the cannabis company has now brought its total contributions to 38.5 million. Again, sadly, you got to pay to play in the U.S. The initiative aims to legalize recreational cannabis in Florida. And the good news is 
from my understanding, we have surpassed the amount needed to uh, get this on the ballot. So from my understanding, based on what I shared on Wednesday, they have been successful, um, and the proposal should be set to be put on the ballot in November 2024. And so, of course, more down here if you want to pause to read. Otherwise, you can grab the link. Um, but with that Air Wellness reaches agreement on GSD, New Jersey, and Sierra Naturals earn out amendments and retains Moellis and Company LLC as financial advisor. And so I am a shareholder of Air Wellness, and what I get out of this is that any fear that Air Wellness could not pay their debt in the next year or so, um, that fear is now can now be relieved because they have more time to pay some of their outstanding debt. As the next 14 million portion of the earnout, which was to be satisfied by issuing 12.5% promissory notes due September 2024 with interest and principal payments, will instead be satisfied by issuing 13.5 promissory notes due December 2026 with monthly interest payments until May 2024 with 1% monthly amortization thereafter. And so no doubt it's going up by 1%, but they've got two more years in order to make um, the cash that will pay it off. And so to me, that, that sounds promising. While uh, there's more to it, there's a lot in this uh, detail and it's kind of confusing, but the payment terms under the EEA, which were expected to result in cash payment of $27.5 million on or before May 1st, 2024, which would have been the start of this month, has been amended to be paid on the later of the date, um, that is a 10 calendar days following the maturity date of AIRS 12.5 senior notes due December 10th, 2024, or May 1st, 2026. So from my understanding, whatever that had to be paid May 1st, again, gives the AIRS some breathing room. They can pay it either December 10th or May 1st, um, no later than December 10th, 2026, though. And so very complicated, but seems like this uh, relieves some of the debt worries that AIR had. That's from my understanding. I could be wrong. Do let me know in the comments. On to some state sales data. Thank you, connoisseurs.io, for this one. Is New Mexico monthly sales data up to April 2023. And again, kind of surprising that we're seeing more sales in March than in April. While April does have the 420 holiday, it seems like in March it's just when you get that first nice weekend, the sun's back out, people want to also spend. And so we'd rather have the spike in one of the two months than not at all. Um, but again, surprised that 420 April sales have dipped versus March, similar to Connecticut sales, similar to uh, Illinois as well, but some other markets have continued strong, and I'm sure we'll see April surpassing March. But with that, uh, adult use sales represented by the orange, and then medical sales represented by red. While looking at Connecticut State Department of Consumer Protection, for April 1st to April 30th, you can pause read for a bit more info here on products sold and average basket size, but adult use market recorded 10.2 million in sales, while medical recorded 11.4 million as uh, adult use sales began June 10th, 2023. So here you can take a look, uh, especially for March and April, 9.5 million in adult use up to 10.2 million, um, while 12.5 million in medical down to 11.4. And then total number of cannabis products sold retail, looking at 234,000 up to 259,000 for adult use, and then average product price per market going down a little bit, 40.69 down to 39.58. So with that, thank you, Scott R. Grossman, for sharing this one. I always like to share this update out of Michigan because it's a bit of an anomaly. Another strong month in Michigan despite falling prices for the consumers, um, up 90% year-over-year pounds sold, although less than March. Third month of sequential pricing and flowers still leading the way, 50% um, of adult use mix. And so bear with me as I'm trying to read his shorthand. Adding once again, headlines focused on sequential drop and in his point of view, not very meaningful, although 420 sales and pricing bump didn't fully translate. But all this to highlight that Michigan, a state with an unlimited license structure, therefore the prices have fallen quite a bit, which is, makes it better for the consumer, harder for the operator. Highlighting though that flower pricing per pound has gone all the way down, but continuously we are seeing flower revenue slowly but surely creep up as more and more pounds or more and more flour is essentially moving out the door. And so obviously the demand is there, Michigan is supplying it, and we're still seeing um, you know, surprising numbers despite the prices falling. So worth highlighting. Um, well, from the Office of Medical Cannabis Use this past week, looking at new dispensaries approved from May 8th to the 12th, we see the flowery approved in Ocala. And then qualified patient count, Florida increased their in their patient count to 816,944 this week, which represents a week over week increase of 1,979. And so hopefully once that telehealth bill sort of comes back into effect, we'll see that number increase, um, but still strong, almost 2,000. Um, while we look at dispensations from May 5th to the 11th, all the MSOs in the state, the number of dispensary locations they have, and then the number of milligrams of TB THC sold this past week, milligrams of CBD sold just this past week alone, and ounces of smokable flour sold this past week. So lots of cannabis moving through Florida for their medical patients. And thank you, connoisseurs.io, again, a great resource for, um, for putting this data into a nice visual for us. Is Florida OMMU weekly update from May 5th to the 11th, true leave number one market share in all segments. Flower 42%, THC 39.8, and CBD 41. While Cure Leaf second in flower, third in THC. Air Wellness second in THC, fourth in flower. Verano uh, third in flower, and fifth in THC. And so 
for what it's worth sharing here. Total flower sales by company, composite read, of course, this might be blocked off. Um, grab the link below if you want. Total THC sales by company, and then total CBD sales by company and total dispensing locations by company. Well, thank you, Hirsch Jane, for sharing this one, because as of Wednesday, legalization in New Hampshire was sadly supposed to be dead in the water because they vetoed to kill the bill that they made. However, big turnaround, as it looks like the uh, governor looked at some new data and realized, oh, fuck, everyone wants legal cannabis. As an ironic, ironically, to a state-run model, so we think a state's going to pay 280E. No way. That's why I was very curious about this approach, but may not be ideal. Give credit to Governor Chris Sununu, never a fan of cannabis, for evolving to respect the will of his citizens and realizing he's got to get reelected. And so... Minnesota being number 23, could New Hampshire be 24 and Ohio 25? Um, link in the store or link in the description if you wanted to go through the story. But a few good comments down here. Uh, Spence Buyer, if a government entity soon feels the wrath of 280E and requisite issues MJ faces, perhaps state-run stores are a good thing um, in getting rid of 280E sooner than later. Because why would any state want to pay federal ta like, tax to the federal government, right? And while I welcome another state legalizing cannabis. Great comment, John. I can't get over the fact that even Republicans are advocating for essentially socialist state ownership of a business. It's fascinating um, how these politicians have evolved outside of what their party believes in. But regardless, MJ Biz Daily sharing, the reality is U.S. cannabis industry's $100 billion economic impact varies by state, no doubt. And while there's a lot in here, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I do invite you to pause to read if you're interested. But there's some cool visuals that I figured I would share. Um, and so this is the first one, economic impact of cannabis by state. Um, from jobs to taxes to real estate, obviously, California has the biggest impact, but you can pause to read um, or grab the link below and go through it just to see, you know, which states uh, contribute more to the economy from cannabis versus others. Florida probably a leading second or getting close. Um, while they've got this other economic impact of cannabis per person, who spends more where um, and how the market is broken up there. So very cool visuals. Of course, more on the link if you wanted to go through the whole thing. Um, but with that, out of New York, Todd Harrison, thank you for this update. Jeffrey's on New York cannabis. This could be big. I've got a lot of stories on this. Um, I'm trying to piece it all together, so bear with me. Um, but updated New York regulators regulation, sorry, could be a big boost for the incumbents as the big changes versus the initial draft from November, our current medical incumbents no longer have to wait three years for adult use stores, which means that MSO operators could potentially open stores, obviously sooner than later, but can now do so as of December this year. Um, fuck, that's still a long ways to wait. While payment of the 20 million transition fee is now more manageable, so hopefully that fee's been reduced. They're going to use it as a, well, you have to contribute to social equity to compete. Um, and then lastly, wholesale remains possible as soon as law becomes effective. So as always, take these with a grain of salt, but lots of good details in here. But this makes me beg the question, MSOs, please tell me you've not dropped the lawsuit against the New York regulators as a compromise to get these regulatory changes because these suck. You would win that lawsuit and you cannot bend your knee to these incompetent communists. You cannot set that precedent. And so with that, Green Market Report shares more shenanigans as New York awards more retail licenses. Since they can't actually do anything and get dispensaries opened, they devalue the existing licenses and hand them out like candy for a headline. You cannot make this shit up. Here's farmers cry for aid. It sucked to be a farmer and believe these politicians, but the meeting swung between emotional highs and lows with the Cannabis Control Board unanimously approving the 50 new retailers bringing the state total of adult use licenses to 215. Not shops, because that's not the case. Licenses. you got to open to be a shop, right? And then New York State now has 10 operational adult use cannabis shops. Yippee! After all this time, you can make it to 10, uh, says Tremaine Wright, announcing at the opening of the meeting with several more anticipated in the coming week, she said. But then get this. Among the 50 new retail permits were 45 shops located in parts of New York that had previously been stalled due to litigation. So 45 of the 50, not even new, just reissuing them and then using it as a headline. Fucking ridiculous. And so pause to read more. Now, of course, you can grab the full article, but I'm just going to show you quickly through it. New rules uh, down to another regulation. Pause to read if you're interested. As at least it's kind of the same info you're getting from Jeffries, but you can compare with a different source. Now, from another regulation down to uh, Damien Fagan, you can pause to read. Oh, yeah, that douchebag who literally said in an interview he wants to purposely handicap the MSOs and stall their progress in New York. Hence what sparked the lawsuit in the first place, I believe. And then social and economic equity, pause to read. And then the last bit, farmers face off with the board, pause to read. And if you wanted to look at the revised regulations, this is a link to it. I'll put the link in the description if you want to check that out out of New York. But last one from uh, Brad Rossino, who is an editor and publisher at New York Canada Insider. From the ground, uh, thank you for providing some personal anecdotes. New story quotes, Grant Carson, first round CAURD licensee award winner. We're all scared. We see all the illegal stores and we don't have any kind of protection. They're trying to push us out into the street saying, don't worry, we're here for you, but realistically, no one is here for us. This is why you need safe more than ever. 
Fucking incompetent regulators. How can they even do this to their people? Grant said he passed as a DASNY Bayside location because the rent is so crazy, or he passed on a location because the rent is so crazy. As a businessman, I thought we were supposed to start slow and then grow and build. I don't know any business person that runs out there and puts down this large amount of money. Gregory Pereira, third round of CURD licensee, the interest rates, the square footage, all these things make me very ambivalent about moving forward. Pereira continued, sometimes we have to hold people accountable. We have to make sure that they're on our side completely and the left hand knows what the right hand is doing and that it's all transparent. So many people are discontent in this process. And then Gary O'Vale, a third round licensee in Long Island who, as part of his due diligence, gathered first and second round CAURD holders on the island to learn about their experiences so far. And all he can say was, I was left with a sense of despair. And so stories will be in the description if you want to check this article out. Discontent and despair. New York cannabis entrepreneurs fed up with the state. No doubt, because while they were promised equal access to opportunity, which is equality, what they got was social equity or equal outcomes for everyone that bought in and was sold on the lies. Hence, now no one can operate a legal dispensary, including the MSOs, and the only ones that seemingly continue to get a paycheck or are benefiting are the incompetent uh, socialist, communist regulators, whatever you want to call them. With that, from our favorite source from across the pond, Tom Blickman, telling us the harsh realities that Europeans face for getting legal cannabis. While we thought it was the 1961 UN drug convention that was in the way of any progress, it turns out German proposals for cannabis regulation might also not be in compliance with the 2004 EU Council framework decision on drugs. Well, that's annoying. Let's abolish this probably useless outdated framework on drugs. Now, I'm happy to see this published in theeconomist.com because it might raise awareness, especially to those in Germany saying, wait, we're not a sovereign nation in the sense we can't reform our laws and we need the EU uh, and the UN to tell us what to do. That's something that we should fix uh, as a nation or, you know, unite the people, bring them together for that. But sadly, TheEconomist.com, while they claim to be, you know, one of the classier papers, cannot keep the puns out of this title. Pretty ridiculous and pretty embarrassing, especially no one finds it funny, especially anyone that's an adult with a head on their shoulders. These issues do deserve respect. Uh, sadly, it seems like uh, magazines now don't hire journalists, they hire propagandists who essentially are just entitled pretentious assholes that want to make us pissed off. Um, but yeah, another reason to stop tuning into mainstream outlets for cannabis news, full of stigma and complete lack of understanding on the issue. Hopefully I do a better job than them. And so with that, another one though from CNBC highlighting what is going on in Europe. So just happy to see this awareness being put out there. These European countries are pushing to legalize weed, but the EU is not on board. And so that should raise questions to these Europeans. Calls to legalize cannabis are mounting across Europe as a growing number of countries seek to replicate progressive moves by Canada and parts of the US. The Czech Republic's National Drug Coordinator last week that said that cannabis should be treated as other substances under his purview, such as tobacco and alcohol, 100% because it's 10 times safer than both. Proposals from governments in Germany to the Netherlands face pushback from the European Union and long-standing conservative views. And so not going to go through the whole thing, but just happy to share and invite you to grab the link if you're interested. But with that, before we end off some studies, this one from Taylor and Francis Online. The effect of cannabis oil, 3% on neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia. Six-month follow-up. This is as of May 8th, 2023. So you can pause to read the objectives and methods, of course. But the results, the following assessment with NPI showed significant improvements of the BPSD in all our in all our patients, not just a few, in all our patients who receive CBD, and no or limited improvements in the second group, regardless of the underlying neuropathology of dementia. Dementia again sounds promising, and why cannabis ought to have been descheduled decades ago. But conclusions: we suggest that CBD may be more effective and safe choice for managing BPSD than the typical intervention. Imagine that CBD, yeah, may be more effective, probably more effective based on the results, but future large randomized clinical trials are needed to reassure these findings so we can keep getting our funding from Big Pharma and keep doing these studies, finding beneficial news, but not seeing any action like descheduling actually come of it. So annoying. Well, we got this one from Health Day, an actual counter approach. Cannabis use implicated in almost a third of cases of schizophrenia in young men. Um, fact check, so it makes me want to believe it a little bit less. And so of course, I wanted to show this contrarian view because this is popular and this has always sort of been the argument, especially from um, propagandists and prohibitionists. And so take you down to this bit too, if you wanted to pause to read. Um, but I figured while I would show this, I would also show when they talk to someone who sort of knows about the new data of cannabis um, and someone that at least in my view is worth trusting a bit more. And so before we get to that, though, the theories that THC, the intoxicating compound in weed, works by binding to brain receptors and creating altered ways of thinking and perceiving the world, she explained. THC can trigger psychotic symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions, which are a hallmark of schizophrenia, Awesome said. Cannabis also increases the release of dopamine in the brain reward system, which can increase feelings of well-being and pleasure. 
Research suggests that there is a link between dopamine levels, psychosis, and schizophrenia. Now, and while research might suggest this, personally, I've never and have never known anyone that's hallucinated from smoking cannabis. And then delusions, of course, technically can mean fantasy or believing something that's not true. And I'll admit there was a point in my life where I quit cannabis for a while, and I almost went down a path that I, at that point, realized this might be a completely delusion or fantasy, and it's better for me to get in touch with reality again. And that actually led me back to cannabis. And so all that to say, um, if, if you're someone that's never once used cannabis, but you're in a place where you're unhappy and you don't don't like where you're at, possibly because you've learned an ideology and you're viewing the world through a framework that does not benefit you at all and you're finally realizing that. Imagine you're smoking cannabis and you perceive that there could be another way and that you might have been wrong. Could a psychotic episode be explained as someone consuming cannabis, not being used to it, seeing that, but then freaking out at the fact that they might have been wrong this time and focusing on that as opposed to taking steps to go down that new path and make that happen for them? Just thinking out loud, that might not have made too much sense, but let me know in the comments if you get what I'm saying. But of course, the many other studies have found no relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia, said Paul Armenanto, Deputy Director of Normal, an advocacy group promoting the reform of cannabis laws and regulations. While claims regarding cannabis and mental illness often and make headlines. There is also an abundance of studies, many published within just a few past months, disputing these allegations, Armenanto said. In particular, two newly published but largely ignored studies, of course they're ignored because they tell the opposite of what most outlets want to share, studies failed to identify any increased risk of psychosis-related outcomes in states where cannabis is legal. Boom. The relationship observed in the new study might also uh, be the other way around, Armenanto added. People with psychotic illnesses might be more likely to self-medicate with cannabis and other controlled substances. Therefore, it remains premature at at best and sensational at worst to claim that a definitive causal relationship exists between cannabis use and the onset of psychiatric disorders, particularly among those not predisposed to the conditions Armenanto said, because of course correlation does not always equal causation. And further, the fact that cannabis has been used by various populations for decades at desperate rates, yet rates of psychosis and other psychiatric disorders have generally remained static over the same period of time, strongly argues against the assertion. And so again, it's just the data is largely ignored by the community, uh, the medical community that would actually do something about it. And of course, it seems like there's an incentive for them to not want to do that, sadly. But with that, our last story from normal analysis. Cannabis legalization in Canada, you guessed it, not linked to uptick in traffic crashes. Love to see it. From May 11th, neither the passage of adult use cannabis legalization nor the growth of retail cannabis sales is associated with any increase in motor vehicle accidents, according to data published in the Journal of Drug and Alcohol Review. So I'll put the... Uh, the study in the description if you want to check it out. There's more here, but just to highlight, the findings are consistent with those of other Canadian studies. One study published last year in the Journal of Drug and Alcohol Dependence found no evidence that the implementation of the Cannabis Act was associated with significant changes in post-legalization patterns of all drivers' traffic injury emergency department visits, or more specifically, youth driver traffic injury ED uh, presentations. Overall, there is no clear evidence that recreational cannabis legalization had any effect on rates of ED visits and hospitalizations for either motor vehicle or pedestrian cyclist injury injuries across Canada. Read it and reap. Take that prohibitionist. You suck. Time to deschedule cannabis and give it back to the people. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great weekend, everybody.